Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our expert interview series. Uh, we are totally honored to have Manu Joseph here today. Uh, Manu's been a developer um, for almost uh, nine years right now, of which he's been in data science and analytics for almost uh, seven years. Uh, and I think Manu's recent focus has been mostly on the uh, revenue optimization, um, uh, spend optimization, marketing activities, uh, and demand prediction side of uh, uh, data science. Um, so, uh, Manu, welcome. Yeah, hi, hi, Vinay. Glad to be here. Sure. Uh, Manu, the you know one of the first questions I had was when you first got into uh, analytics, uh, how did you do that, and what can our members learn from that? Very specific tips they can take away. All right. So, uh, if you look at my career path, right, you can see that it's from engineering. Then I went into software engineering at Cognizant for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. Half a year, and then I took an MBA with uh, supply chain and operations as a as a major. Uh, then after that, I started working as a supply chain consultant. Uh, then moved into an analytics consultant, and then became an uh, a data scientist. Yeah. Uh, so if you look at it, like I mean, I've always been fascinated with numbers. I mean, actually modeling real world problems as as uh, mathematical problems, and you can see that in my choices, right? My uh, engineering is there, and then. Uh, even the M MBA specialization, I chose something which is more mathy than uh, the marketing of finance is more mathy, yeah. more abstract. Mm -hmm. But yeah, uh, so because of that, right? I've always had this uh, this thing, and after SC after the MBA, right? When I joined the company as an SEM consultant, it was SEM consultant plus and using data. Uh, so I think my 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 trust with data started there. And I've been, uh, so there it was mostly, you know, classical statistics and uh, the supply chain mathematics, uh, which was there. And then I realized that that is what I want to do. And then I slowly started transitioning into the data science role. Mm -hmm. So what actually made that transition possible was my, my stint at uh, Philips, mm -hmm. uh, where I was like an analytics consultant. I was part of a, a supply chain COE for analytics. Yeah. Uh, and there... When I was a part of there, and then I was seeing a lot of um, lot of you know, peers uh, doing a lot of different things, I got interested in this, and I started. I thought that I should be upskilling myself. Yeah. And I, uh, as like a million other people have done, I've taken, I took the uh, Andrew and G Coursera course. Yeah. Uh, that. Machine learning. Yeah. Mm. Uh, but I think probably one thing that I, I kind of did differently, uh, was that I did not stop after doing that MOOC. Uh, because now I know that I've seen a lot of people who are trying to get into the field, right? Uh, they take their first MOOC and they kind of stop learning. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like the first mistake that you can do because a MOOC is more like a starting point and nobody gives up yeah. uh, the rest of the starting point. So that's one of the main things that you keep learning. And what do you suggest they do next after a MOOC, Manu? After a MOOC, yeah. After a MOOC, you put that uh, whatever skills that you've learned, mm. you look for opportunities to put that into practice. Mm -hmm. Only, I mean, if it is part of your work, mm -hmm. then that's brilliant. Mm -hmm. uh, because what I've done was uh, while I was doing the MOOC, I was also learning Python in parallel, and whatever SQL processes or other processes that that were happening in my line of work, I was replicating that in Python. So that I get more hands-on experience there. And then, like I was on the lookout for doing something uh, in this area. And when such an opportunity came, right? When I saw one opportunity, I approached my manager and asked them, asked him that this is an opportunity that I want to pursue. Yeah. Uh, and we can do this together and all those uh, things. Sure, sure. And he was happy about it. Mm -hmm. So then I took that opportunity and started building my career from there. Understood, understood. And apart from the, you know, uh, uh, the Andrews um, uh, Coursera MOOC, uh, are there other specific blogs, resources, projects that you would refer back to? So, yeah, that's the thing. Right? I mean, mm. I don't have a single source where I keep going back to, apart from probably the Kaggle forums, mm -hmm. uh, which is like a treasure trove of information. Mm. Um, although I'm, I don't compete very well. I mean, I don't compete. I don't spend that time to do the competition, yeah. but I still read the, the forums. Uh, I still read the solutions that part, uh, that comes out of it. It gives you a lot of ideas and it got, it, a lot of tricks that you can use to kind of make your models perform better. Yeah. Uh, but apart from that, uh, I think my main go-to source is just Google. 
go to google search you'll get uh, at least two or three good blogs mm -hmm. uh, which which talks about the topic that you want to learn right. start there start there and mm -hmm. then you know i mean in that blog they will be mentioning some paper or some other blogs mm -hmm. you go and read that mm -hmm. so that's that's how i kind of uh, you know, learn. Okay. Okay. And you know, from your uh, background, when you talk about it, you talk about how you're involved in end to end projects. Uh, yeah. And it's probably pretty, it's a pretty straightforward definition for you. But then for the benefit of the viewers, can you help us understand what is end to end? Uh, what are the different parts in that chain? Oh, all right. So like currently my role, right? It's a little more um, a, a senior uh, role. Yeah. Uh, where I'm actually involved in like right from the conception of a project. So when you when you see that there is an opportunity at a, at a different client, right? Uh, I am involved at that stage in the sales initiatives, enabling the uh, BD to, to, to make that pitch successfully. Then once the client is with us, right? I actually work with them to to, to fine tune and like really nail down the problem. Yeah. But, because that's one of the key aspects because mostly the customer would be coming to us with a symptom as yeah. in I have this problem. And then it's up to us to actually work with them to find out a, a, a way to apply analytics to that solution mm -hmm. and get value to the customer. Mm -hmm. So I'm involved in that post process. Mm -hmm. Then the the usual ML cycle ha happens, right? The, the, the pre-processing, the... Uh, the Cleaning or analysis, cleaning, yeah. Cleaning analysis, right. the, entire, the entire process. Yeah. So there I would be more, uh, right now, I mean, in the in my earlier days, I was actually doing that that piece. Uh, but right now, I, since I have multiple projects, I usually give technical guidance and mm -hmm. project management and mm -hmm. uh, be kind of like a guide and guiding, like a technical guide in most of these projects. Yeah. Uh, then the, the, the last and important point is the stakeholder management. Right. So all through the project, we have okay. to keep that 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 relationship with the customer yeah. because we are basically a consulting organization. Yeah? So then right. that, that maintaining that relationship and growing it is is also a, a part of okay. my role. And yeah. uh, the other thing I was curious about is you somehow find time outside of all this to write a blog called Deep and Shallow. Uh, can you you know help us understand what is the motivation behind it and uh, uh, how has it helped you do that? Right. So. Yeah, finding time is something that I am kind of constantly working on uh, because it's, it's it's a very difficult thing to do actually to find time for yourself. Um, but actually from the, uh, I mean, the motivation behind writing the blog is more along the lines of, you know, uh, Richard Feynman, uh, he, he's, he's, um, he has quoted that uh, if you want to learn something, you should be able to explain it. Teach it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Teach it. So that's the driving force because I uh, I'm I'm a person who who constantly wants to upgrade myself or learn new new uh, new stuff, mm -hmm. and I found that this is one of the best ways that I can force myself to do it yeah. because if I am writing something on a topic, mm -hmm. I will be doing much more research or understanding and be developing that understanding much mm -hmm. better mm -hmm. so that I can condense that into a into that blog. Understood. And this blog also serves like a uh, like a go-to reference for me because if I uh, you know, forget something, or if I want to say, tell somebody else to look mm. up something, mm. I can just reference this blog. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's also helping in my uh, my career. Uh, that's a pretty good tip. That as you keep learning and doing projects, uh, uh, no matter where you're in in your career, keep publicizing it, writing a blog about it. Right? Not only will you learn better, but you might actually get some attention from the outside world. Okay. 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 Great. Um, I, I was I, I was noticing one of your projects, Mano, which uh, talked about predicting uplift of a promotion. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, for a CPG company. Uh, so the specific question I had was, if I Google for that project, I'll find lots of code on GitHub, something on Kaggle, there's lots of stuff in that area. How right. is a real project for a client different mm -hmm. from what someone would find on a Kaggle? And what are the, what is the, the delta gap there? Right. So uh, I think one of the key differences what you'll find between a Kaggle project and mm -hmm. a real life project yeah. is the data. Mm. Uh, because when you're uh, the Kaggle project and the Kaggle Kaggle data sets, right? It's like carefully curated, mm -hmm. and uh, like there are no missing, I mean, hardly any missing rows and hardly any unrelevant, irrelevant uh, columns. Mm -hmm. um, and even the the distribution of your data is also constant between your train and test. Mm -hmm. It will be constant, mm -hmm. but when you're in the real 
different situation, right? It's mm. it's totally different. Mm. Uh, one is you'll have data which is scattered across a, a, a million places, which mm. you'll have to go and find, uh, bring it together, mm -hmm. join properly, mm. do all that, all that thing. Mm -hmm. And even after that, right? Mm. The other problem, for example, in this project, right? What I was uh, having a lot of problems were, were with with something called covariance shift, mm. which is basically the the distribution of the data in the training side is is not the same as the distribution of the data in the prediction side. Right. So uh, so in such situations, right, the the models typically does not do well. Mm -hmm. uh, so then I had to go looking for uh, different ways of combating this. Mm -hmm. Read about it, and eventually I I stumbled upon something called an adversarial validation. Okay. Uh, which you kind of this is one of the techniques which, which you can use to uh, combat this problem mm -hmm. and then i uh, re read about it applied it and it actually gave me like a two percent or three percent bump in uh, i see so this is mostly what hap what's happening in a in a real world situation because uh, uh, this data drift or like and another one is basically after the model is done right mm -hmm. in most of our business scenarios the, the stakeholders want explainability. Mm, right. So they want to know what's happening and how it is happening. And they actually sometimes go right down to individual observations and then why did this happen like this? Mm. So it's up to us to kind of help them understand uh, in, a, in a layman's language uh, what the model is doing. Understood. So that Understood. Okay. So in summary, basically, fundamentally, the data itself is a lot more unorganized and unclean. And mm -hmm. To cope up with that, you have to come up with very specific ways of cleaning it up or solving it, and then eventually presenting it in a manner that the business uh, can interpret and get value from it. All these are obviously absent in a textbook example or an online project. Good, good. Yeah, because okay. the Kaggle project is mainly concentrating on the modeling modeling part of it. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of things that you can do in that modeling, and that is for that Kaggle mm -hmm. is awesome. Yeah. Uh, but outside that, there are a few things that that is not really covered in the Kaggle uh, context. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay super. And, um, uh, you know, for a, a data science career aspirant who's trying to break, break into the field, uh, if they had to focus on one thing, one thing only, uh, what should that be? I would say it would be reading. Mm -hmm. uh, this field is, is, is very dynamic. It's, um, like if you're not not reading up for about a month or two months, there'll always be a something else that you don't know about, which comes mm -hmm. out mm -hmm. because the research is happening at such breakneck speed. Yeah, it's very difficult to handle. Mm -hmm. But uh, apart from that, even if you don't want to keep updated to the the, the most cutting edge research, yeah. even if you constantly keep reading, yeah. uh, what thing I do is I always try to. Um, so if I am comfortable in one particular area, mm -hmm. I always try to go and find some areas which are not comfortable yeah. and start working on it. Right. So I always keep learning new, new things. Yeah. And it's one of the key things that I think is, is, is very important in, uh, in building your confidence and in building your, uh, your skills. Understood. So reading okay. up. Yeah, absolutely. Super. And, um, you know, for those of us who can never seem to find time, uh, you have somehow found time to write a blog and also release your own uh, PyTorch library, uh, right? Called uh, PyTorch Tabula. Um, my first question is, um, what is so special about PyTorch uh, compared to Akeras? Uh, why is it uh, suddenly so popular? That is the first question. And the second question is, what motivated it, you, you to come up with this library? What is that thing you found missing that made you uh, build this library? Right, right. Yeah. So... So I'll take the first one with right? PyTorch. Uh, it's just a very beautiful way of understanding. Uh, so if you are, if you want to actually really understand deep learning, right? Mm. Uh, when you're using Keras, you just take a layer, you stack on top of it, and then you do the fit. You don't really get to know what's happening inside, uh, and that's okay for 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 some use cases uh, where you have standard things available. Uh, but if you want to do something re uh, research oriented, or if you want to tweak some model, right, it is difficult. Uh, and I mean, Keras has the back back end is TensorFlow, uh, and at least TensorFlow 1.0, the old one, right, was is, I mean, according to me, it's a nightmare to work with. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very difficult to debug. It's, it's horrible. Uh, 
<laughs> but on the other side, Python, a PyTorch is very Pythonic, uh, and you can debug it very easily. You can drop down to the uh, the, the intricacies of the model mm -hmm. and make changes if you want to. Mm -hmm. That's something that I kind of uh, find awesome, and that's why I kind of moved completely towards PyTorch. I see. TensorFlow two point two is I heard it's better. I mean, mm -hmm. all of the a uh, lot of the problems which were there is not there right now. It's becoming similar to PyTorch now. But yeah, that's why PyTorch. Understood. And PyTorch tabular is basically so the tabular world, right? Uh, standard uh, tabular tables and uh, regressions and classification in that kind of morality. Uh, has been like predominantly dominated by gradient boosting, uh, which is all of your XT boosts and uh, your uh, like GPMs. Uh, but recently, right, there has been con uh, an, a concentrated effort in getting deep learning to work better in such in in this modality. Uh, and there were a few models, which which a few research papers which came recently. Uh, but when I was looking at it, right, uh, there was no real framework out there. Which which actually tackled this modality, uh, apart from fast AI. Mm. Uh, fast AI did just that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but uh, I don't know. Uh, fast AI is uh, a little more difficult to hack uh, mm -hmm. because it has a lot of custom uh, optimizers and a lot of things inside mm -hmm. the hood. It's very mm -hmm. difficult to hack. Mm -hmm. So that's why I I, I was kind of uh, leaning towards this another framework, um, which which is PyTorch at the base, and then there is an awesome library called PyTorch Lightning. Uh, which uses which which basically abstracts the training part of the type of Python uh, into a very scalable and usable form, and then I'm using these two as the base. I kind of built a a standard uh, data ingestion and, and configuration tensor and a base model, which can be extended to any other model just by changing the one of the one method. Mm -hmm. that you can mm -hmm. just change, it. and you can so uh, how I envision is this is that. This will be useful for both uh, the research uh, side of things as well as the industry application. Yeah. Uh, because this this takes off a lot of the software engineering need to do to make, mm -hmm. a, make a deep learning model work, mm -hmm. and then this into a dot fit method, which yeah. is similar to Keras, mm -hmm. but also allows you the flexibility of PyTorch uh, by in by by developing or a, by enabling you to uh, have custom models. Mm -hmm. So that's the. Um, motivation behind it. Yeah. Awesome, it's pretty fascinating. Um, uh, and you know, the other thing was uh, one of the things we focus at Project Pro is basically to help um, users get their work done faster mm -hmm. by giving them like reusable templates. Uh, I'm curious from your own experience, what are some hacks or tactics or processes that you have relied on to mm -hmm. get your projects done more efficiently and faster? All right. Um, Throw XT boost at it. <laughs> <laughs> most, almost always works. Right. <laughs> but but more seriously, right? Uh, uh, the 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 tools that I use kind of change um, according to the the time that I work. Uh, because re recently I I kind of do my initial investigation and modeling through Py PyCarrot, uh, which is the recent uh, a low code mechanism, right? Yeah. It yeah. actually helps us uh, iterate through a lot of uh, different models at one. One simple uh, call to the API. Mm. Uh, so after that initial step is done, I kind of figure out what is the model that I want to do, mm. or what is the kind of models that I want to explore. Mm -hmm. Then drop back to my own kind of code base because I keep um, building them. So basically, whenever I'm working on a project, right, yeah. I keep saving those codes into modular, modularized forms mm. into one of my my own kind of library. So I, I can see. Using it, reuse it. Uh, yeah, reuse it. Mm -hmm. uh, so whenever I'm doing something new, also right. Mm -hmm. Once I'm done with it, I try to modularize it mm -hmm. so that I can like use it, reuse it when I am doing the same, similar thing in the future. Right. So I kind of drop down to that one and then yeah. quickly iterate. So Interesting. That's the, yeah. Super. So basically, you kind of prototype it or make a POC using PyCaret. Yeah. Uh, and then you rely on your repository of your own libraries or modules of code to uh, kind of release it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Super. Uh, well, it's been very helpful, Manu. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Yeah, it's uh, been great to see you as well. Congratulations on your uh, new library. We'll definitely be sure to pass it on to our viewers. Yeah. Yeah. Look forward to uh, working together. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah.